right, we are now recording. Um, so all this is for posterity, Ford. We, we cannot escape it. Um, let me start with the, uh, by reading from, welcome to everybody, first of all. Already I messed up. Welcome everybody. This is the guest of honor interview with uh, Jeff Ford. And uh, I am Andy Duncan, your, your moderator and, and interrogator today. Although I hope to do very little talking and let Jeff do most of it, which is very unlike me. But I will start, <laughs> I will start by reading from, uh, from the, uh, a sacred tome, the ReaderCon program participant questionnaire which I recommend everyone to read if they have a free couple of days. Uh, guest of honor, Jeffrey Ford is an author and educator who bends and blends the boundaries of fantasy, science fiction, and mystery to create dark fantasies and surrealist tales. In the 40 years since his first genre publication, he has published 10 novels and over 100 short stories, many compiled in his six collections. His work has won or been shortlisted multiple times for every major American science fiction and fantasy award and several in other countries. He's also an experienced professor and lecturer on writing and early American literature his writing has been described as whimsical, narratively ambitious, filled with magic curses and dangerous technology and dark and subtle all at once. So welcome, Jeff Ford. Thanks for being here. Was there a comma between magic and curses? Yes, magic comma, curses comma, and dangerous technology is how they had it. You, you mean you did not read this? You did not read your own write-up on, uh, on the form? I did see this somewhere. I, I, I have seen it somewhere. I've seen that, yeah. Uh, it rings a bell. So congratulations, first of all, on being one of the guests of honor this year. How did you find out and when did you find out? Well, they, I think I found out right before the COVID uh, hit, you know, because they didn't, I don't think they, did they have it last year? I don't think they did, did they? I don't think so. Did they have a Redacon last year? I don't think they did. Yeah, they, I found out like for that one, I found out for that one right before COVID hit, I think. And then, uh, and then, um, you know, the COVID came on and they moved it to uh, this year. So that's when I found it's been a, it's been a while I've been uh, you know that this has been in the air. Do uh, what do you uh, what do you think about the virtual convention as a phenomenon? I mean, we've all been learning our way around them, particularly the organizers. We've done a couple of them now. Uh huh. Listen, I've done a couple of them now, and I taught on Zoom for two semesters. And I have to say, I mean, it's miraculous, really, what you can do with Zoom. But uh, as far as teaching went, I had a very hard time with it. As far as getting together with people I know, like other writers, or uh, participating in panels and readings and stuff like that, it works OK. But let's face it, I'd rather sit with you at a bar somewhere you know, and, and, and BS for a while, face to face than, uh, you know, on this situation here. But, you know, you, you have to, you have to make, uh, you have to make adjustments for reality. <laughs> yeah, it's and true. It's better, you know, it's better to uh, be away to, to have one more uh, season where it's safe, that people are separate somewhat. And then everything's will get going, you know, next year. So it's fine. I'm cool with it. Well, a, a lot of people have suggested that there's a permanent place for this with all the conventions and all the organizations, you know, because of accessibility issues, for example. It's so much easier 
for people yeah. to participate without traveling, for example. That would be that would be the ones I don't go to. That's the ones I won't go to. But, but I uh, no, it's cool. These but people I, are really doing a good job too, Rose and, and the people who are putting this together. I mean, it's really been uh kind of interesting to see what happens behind the scenes, you know, with some of this stuff. And also, uh, they've been really nice to me. So there's no complaints here as far as it goes, you know. The, uh, but what you say about the teaching being merely okay, I find that it's really hard in many ways in the classroom to, to go to a virtual classroom from a physical space particularly with getting to know the students. Is, have you found that sort of thing to be an issue? Plus they don't have the sense of the bounds. I mean, I had one guy comes on, he has no shirt on, he's in his room, you know, and I have to remind him like, get dressed. Uh, another guy was driving a Columbus while he was taking the class. I was like, you can't do that. Are you gonna have an accident or something? So all kinds of stuff like that. You know, they're easily distracted because their friends are in the room with them or one kid just starts. I mean, he's a he's an athlete. He just starts bouncing a basketball, you know, while while we're sitting there, which is probably something he does all the time. But, uh, you know, I got a rack of people here and, you know, so basically, yeah, I would say it was dreadful, you know, as far <laughs> as my college teaching experience goes. Right. Basically dreadful. But it's still a miracle, you know what I mean? It's amazing that you can do it. It's sure better than nothing. Uh, yeah, well, that's true, too, because then we can get paid, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, there is right? that. Pay, pay, salaries are important for everybody. Yeah. Um, but I know teaching is really important to you and always has been. And I, I'm glad that the ReaderCon home addressed that and that's one thing I wanted to talk about to you because you you're one of those folks whose writing career and teaching career were really started simultaneously is that right pretty much I mean I had been I I had been writing since I was a little kid I mean I wrote you know my whole life but uh I started publishing stuff when I I guess it was around the time when um, I had some, I had some uh, some stories uh, published when I was in graduate school, and then when I took that job in Jersey, that at that community college, I really started like getting the idea, you know, getting how to do it and like sending stuff out and everything. So yeah, I mean, and I at that job I would I would drive two hours each way, uh, and I had five classes a semester. And I, I still wrote novels and stuff like that. So when people tell me, like, if I only had more time, I'd write a book. I want to get them in one of these things and hit them in the head. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you how did you find the time? Did you make use of that long commute, for example, even when you were driving? Yeah, that was great. I did so much planning. I mean, not even planning, but just like seeing the stories in my head and like, you know, thinking about the characters, following the characters, where they were going and so forth. Uh, and then it, it, it was like, I had this technique where if I was writing a novel, I'd play the same CD every night so that the music, when the music started, I would fall into the story like so much more easily. But I mean, it was like a prompt to like just fall into the story. It's to the point where one night, my kids took my boom box out on the back porch and I was writing and I thought the music was on, but then I looked down once I didn't hear it again. I looked down and the box was gone. <laughs> so it's like Pavlov's writer. You know? Did, did the, did the, C, all, did okay. the CD have to have any particular thematic relevance to the text you were writing or was no, it I just always, random? I always use Harold Budd. No, I always use Harold Budd. I mean, it's all head music, you know? It's not the kind of stuff I would listen to at a party, but, you know, it's uh, it's head music. I don't know how else to describe it. 
is it instrument like you know quite is what? it instru is it instrumental only no no vocals yeah it's still voice every once in a while there's some crazy voice in the back like moaning you know <laughs> but other than that it's pretty much instrumental yeah you, uh -huh. i suggest him for rice and there are some writers who already were hip to him uh kj bishop used to listen to him a lot i don't know if you remember her and uh, I think Anna Tambor was telling me that she listened to him, too. But there are other people, too. I think uh, Craig Gidney said he was a big fan of uh, Bud's work for his writing, too, you know? So, yeah, he's good. Well, the, the teaching you were doing at the time and the writing you were also doing, one must have fed the other or influenced the other to some extent. Well, I had this one class. I mean, I write about it. Some some of the students from it. I, I, there's a couple in the new book, like a story about some of these students in the new book. But I taught this class for uh, people with what they called at the time. I don't know what the appropriate term is now, but learning disabilities, which was basically like this like catch basin class at the bottom of the uh, department, and it met in it met in the basement of the humanities building, which was fitting, you know, ironically fitting the way that they thought about it. So nobody wanted to teach this class. It was beneath everybody. I volunteered for it. I was like, this is going to be a trip, you know, and I saw all kinds of situations, uh, you know, uh, dyslexia, whatever they call, you know, whatever Asperger's is now called, whatever, uh, you know, um, uh, all these dr people on psychotropic drugs, people with you know, minimal abilities. I had to teach some guy like the alphabet one time. Anybody who, who had a high school degree, a high school diploma could get into this program. So what also happened at that time was they closed down a mental institution that was just down the street, Marlboro. And a lot of the people couldn't take care of the people that they had in there during the day. So they signed them up. They had high school diplomas and they signed them up and they came to uh, Brookdale and I got a lot of them in that class. So, I mean, it's very strange, but here's the thing. Um, from, from noticing, they, have, they, know, they knew they had issues in writing, you know, and in the ways that they tried to circumvent the problems that they had, I saw all kinds of possibilities, uh, you know, for fiction writing in what they did. I mean, I really learned a lot from them uh, and uh, irreplaceable, irreplaceable techniques and stuff like that, that, you know, you wouldn't think of because you don't have that kind of lack of facility with the regular way of writing. You know what I mean? So yeah. That was fun. Plus, I did, I taught our early American lit, which was a blast, you know, from uh, Native American stuff to... Um, now, we never got as far as Melville. We never got, we've meant to every semester, but we never, we just used to read more and more stuff about it. My buddy I taught with, uh, Bill Watkins, who's also a science fiction writer, uh, William John Watkins, mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, you know, he had all kinds of stuff and information and everything that we, uh, that we kept, we kept like reading up on, you know, all kinds of people. Uh, you know, that, that we tried to incorporate into the thing. We never got to like, we never got to a lot of the old dead white guys. <laughs> you know? Well, that's just just as well. Uh, as Brett Cox says, the yeah. dead, dead white guys with three names. That was what his thesis was at Duke, <laughs> basically. Um, but you, you, now, what what years was this? You were talking about the uh, the the people with the that that really diverse group of people, all with issues that you were volunteered to teach. I taught that for like I taught that about fifteen for about fifteen years. So which oh, once in a while somebody else would quit me. Right. What's that? And and what decade? What years? What decade was this? And you and did you have any training at all for any that of that? No, I had zero training. I had I, I taught for like I taught during like the late eighties and nineties and that, you know? Yeah. Like maybe uh maybe like eighty eight onward for fifteen years, you know, until I, I left there. I, I guess, guess I stopped a couple of years before I left because I wanted Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, finish. 
Go ahead, Andy. No, I was uh, going to say, I, I stopped a couple years before I left because uh, they wanted to train some younger people in it, you know, which I was yeah. fine with by that point. You know, I was, I was good with it. But, but that's, um, that's they needed it. younger people to yeah. be interested in it, you know. But that says a lot for you. I mean, every, I know every teacher has similar situations where they're flung into teaching something that they feel they have no training in at all. But you must have succeeded there in part just because you were helping these folks and you enjoyed their company. You enjoyed helping them and getting to know them. I did, that I did. And uh, plus it was like, you know, nobody else wanted to do it. So I was happy to do it. It was really, mm -hmm. really, really, uh, it was a great experience. I have to say that really great experience. I learned a lot about you know what the thing is too about if you have a student like i had students who were like i don't know what the appropriate term is now whatever because i've been out of it so long but you know paraplegic students who would who were in wheelchairs who were drooling all the time and stuff with a big like diaper there that you had to wipe their mouth with and you know all this stuff and i really learned how to face people and just dive in you know what i mean and dive in and not be put off by those things that a lot of people are put off by when people, uh, you know, have certain disabilities and things like that. So I just learned to dive in and get with them and uh, and learned how to like find where they were at and like get together with them, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but that was one of the best things about that class. To, to, to meet them where they are and talk to them as, as human beings and see very similar, exactly. I just, yeah. I just saw I just saw that documentary about Oliver Sacks that was on PBS that was on American Masters. Oh really? And it, yeah. and it taught and that was a theme of his life that that the 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 people that other folks thought were hopeless causes or real pardon the phrase mental cases he would view them as this is fascinating your life is fascinating tell me all about yourself I want to I want to understand you. I want to know how you see the world. Yeah, now, that, it, some heartbreak in it too, but uh, you know, it's it's pretty. Uh, it was pretty fascinating. It was great, and the people I met through it were, were fantastic. Yeah. So, and you're still teaching. You've been teaching all along, various undergraduate populations. You know, all this time. I teach at I teach at Ohio Wesleyan now. I came out here and Lynn wanted to take this job at OSU. It was her dream job, <clears throat> and she said, uh, "If you go out to Ohio with me, uh, you don't have to teach anymore. You could just write, okay?" So I came out here and I looked around and I was like, "What the fuck?" You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and and I didn't write a damn thing. I didn't write a damn thing for six months. And then I was like, you know what, man? I got to get a couple of classes. So I went and got a couple of classes at Ohio Wesleyan. This young guy hired me, uh, and he was he was really nice to me. He was the head of the department at the time. <clears throat> and I got in there, and it's a great place. I mean, it's a great place. The people are nice. The pay is amazing, and it's not even a union shop. You know what I mean? Um, and... Um, I was always pro, always union out in uh, Jersey. I'm, I, I still am union supporter, but in this situation, you know, this was like chump change. But they paid me good, and I teach two, usually two comp classes. I have taught some creative writing there, you know, once in a while. But uh, the comp is great. I love composition. Most people can't stand it. I like it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's pretty. Uh, all the things, all the problems I face in writing during the day, I mean, they're having the same problems, basically, on maybe a little different level or something, but I could definitely commiserate, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, the students are great. It's great hanging around with young people. I mean, that's really where it's at when you get old. <laughs> if you could do that, you're lucky, <laughs> you know? Yes, I agree. But I, it's interesting that you say you love teaching comp because... Uh, I don't think Chip Delaney loves comp per se, but he has written about how everywhere he goes, 
they say, oh, of course, you'll be teaching all this creative writing. And he says, basically, do I have to? There's a lot of things that he feels more, more uh, uh, capable of teaching, less mysterious yes. than, than, than fiction writing, basically. Well, um, fiction writing is, I taught a ton of that out, in, you know, in Jersey, and I taught a lot of it in different settings like Clarion and, you know, uh, different Richard Hugo house and all these other things. I have no problem with that. I could wake up from a dead sleep and walk into a classroom and teach that. No problem at all, you know. I mean, it's basically just my bullshit, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? So... You but know. you, but your, but your, uh, your bullshit has, has, uh, has, has, has a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of value in it through the years. I mean, I was looking through a lot of the published interviews you've done and a lot of the story notes to your, to your, in your collection. And, and, uh, and there's a lot of wisdom in there and it seems to be an evolving wisdom. It is, it's a set of lessons learned. It has to be. And I was just, you know, it's funny you should say that because I was just, uh, I just taught writers hotel uh, thing. Uh, but uh, we teach this, it's usually in New York, but it was online this year. And I, I did my usual class, you know, fiction writing. I did like a, a two and a half hour lecture about it, you know. And then they did some writing at the end, but um, but I, I actually, when I was done with it, I said to myself, like, I, I have to reevaluate all this now. You know, after I've talked about it, there were times when I wasn't absolutely sure of what I, you know, of what I was saying. I mean, most, for the most part, ninety percent I am, but always these things pop up and then you have to reevaluate them and then you change a little bit you know as you go or you read something new by some fantastic young writer or something and you want to uh you know take those put them in your bag of tricks you know what i mean for the future uh and learn that way too so there's influences all over the place and you have to have your ear open to them although you need to have confidence in yourself at the same time and stand your ground you know for certain things but it's good to always have your ear open to, uh, to what's going on new and, and what's happening these days. Are there new writers or new books that you are stories that you have read lately that you're are really doing it for you that you're really jazzed about or that is help are helping teach you things? Yeah, but uh, now now I have to think about what titles are. <laughs> <laughs> titles are the first to go, aren't they? I yeah. know. I can never remember. I'm like, what was that one? You know, <laughs> what was that? I just did an interview not too long ago. I was like, what was that one where, uh, what's your name, puts the rabbit in the pot? <laughs> I, mean, <don't> you? <laughs> I know. That's it's, the level I'm at, Andy. The, All right, I'm thinking two writers. Well, yeah. you know, uh, I just did a panel thing with Sam Miller. He's a really good writer. He was uh, you know, a, a student of mine at Clarion, so I followed his, mm -hmm. I don't think I taught him a damn thing, but I mean, he's a terrific writer. Laura Donnelly also from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Clarion. Mm -hmm. um, who else? Oh, you know, uh, where I'm learning, where I really um, love uh, Colson Whitehead's writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, I read The Intuitionist. I haven't read The Underground Railroad. I got that one saved. Mm -hmm. But I read the new one, which I can't remember the name of, but the scene that's the, the boxing match in that thing is just so beautifully written, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's always good to see that kind of stuff and like how much better you could do on the next, you know, thing like that that you're going to do, you know? Uh, who else? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of people I read. I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled with the, the stuff in the horror genre with like Stephen Graham Jones Mm, yeah. Stuff. I mean, he's always been a good writer, but in recent years, he's really, he's really clicking. And the thing is, is like, he takes these things from the genre. Like his latest thing is "My Heart Is a Chainsaw." You ever seen that one? Yeah. I mean, but he takes that and the and the one about the uh, the one before that. I think it's a novella. The one. Uh, oh. 
I can't remember it, but he takes these things that are like, you know, Saturday night uh, reruns from the horror genre. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he knows like every slasher flick and, you know, that's out there and then repurposes them into these new kind of fictions, you know? Which yeah. Is really kind of, which is really yeah. Exciting, actually. What you have Very done, exciting. you have done some of that. Now I'm forgetting your title, but your Minotaur story. Your your Minotaur uh, novelette or novel, oh, the, the cosmology of the yeah. wider world. Yes, right. I have read that at the time you said you had set out to say, okay, what's what's the sort of crapola I would never write? What sort of schlock and how to how to make it a Jeff Ford story? Even in even in, could you talk a little about that? Because that's very Stephen yeah, that's Graham Jones ish. I, saw, I, I was thinking to myself, what's the worst shit out there now? And it's like, come on, talking animals. You know what I mean? Talking animals. Although I'm a huge fan of the Jungle Book and Wind in the Willows, you know, those books. But I was thinking talking animals has got to be low, low on the pole. But And then I, I set out to do it. And, uh, you know, I did, this, I did that one. There's also another book to that that's never been published oh. to that, to that uh that thing that's never been published and there should be a third one but i don't think i'm ever going to get around to them you know i'm going to put peps on that job so <laughs> and get it out there you know, so I, people I can do see that it with my reading too like oh, i go into a bookstore and i would go down the row with my eyes closed and i run my finger down the row and wherever i stop i would look and see like where am i and then whatever book seemed like the least likely i would like I would take it and read it. Like, that's how I ended up reading, like, a lot of uh, Virginia Woolf and, like, you know, uh, Jane Austen. And they turned out to be amazingly great, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, so. I, I marvel that in a genre that supposedly has no boundaries, could go in any direction, so many people are so, like, uh, sort of boxed in on what they read or what they like, you know, uh, and and I love I love how egalitarian, how expansive your reading lists always are. I mean, you're I mean you're one of the most real read people, uh, along with Chip Delaney. You two are among the most well read people I I know uh, anywhere. Well, when I see his Facebook page, I got like I take notes. You know, he's always got books on there. Uh, I know him and uh, Lisa Tuttle were talking about some books one time, and I jotted them down and got them, and they blew my blew my mind. You know, so I keep an eye on what he what he uh, what he talks about on there. But uh, you know, I don't I don't really I'm not a big genre reader. I mean, I read stuff I read stuff that's you know has. Uh, has elements of horror in it or fantasy or science fiction, but there's tons of, of all kinds of literature out there that has these things. So the other thing is this, when I was coming up writing, I mean, and I was in college studying with Gardner, I mean, literature was fantasy. It was Grendel, it was, uh, you know, uh, Gravity's Rainbow, uh, it was Vonnegut, it was Barth, it was Bartholomé, you know, some surrealist stuff. Kathy was, Acker, uh, Angela Carter, Angela Carter yeah. yeah. Right, and then all, and oh, then all Tony the, Morrison. Uh, the South American writers. Yeah, Tony Morrison, a lot of the South American writers, you know, and Central yep. American writers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when people tell me fantasy's not literature, it's like a disconnect for me, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, when you and your friend early on were putting together that early American lit syllabus, those readings, did you have any conscious effort of trying to get in a lot of Poe or Hawthorne or horror or fantasy content, or was that even a consideration? We, I did Poe. He did the early part. He, he, was, he really loved the Puritans. I mean, not love the Puritan ideal, but he loved the, you know, all the, the Michigas of the Puritans. He loved that whole thing. And he knew all about like the, uh, you know, going from, you know, all the, all the different 
royalty in Britain and all that stuff. And, you know, he was great at it. I learned a lot from him about that because I eventually had to go out on my own and do the class. But, uh, you know, uh, we did Poe. I did, I did Poe a lot. We did, I always did for like every semester for like, I don't know how many years, <coughs> maybe 24 years. I always did um, Fall of the House of Usher and The Mask of the Red Death, uh, you know, were, were two that I that we did in class. Um, always the Raven to get started, you know. And then uh, The Minister's Black Veil from Hawthorne, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, well, and also, I mean, I, I didn't do much of this, but Charles Brockton Brown was also like a, you know, Carwin the Villaquist and, and and those kind of things were also very fantastic in a way. I mean, you know, it's like um, his book um, Wyland has a spontaneous combustion at the center of it, uh -huh. just like Dickens. You know, uh, uh, what uh, the, the one with the court case? Um, uh, Bleak House. What's that one with the court? Bleak case? House. Bleak House. Yeah. Right. yeah. Wondering if he stole that from Wyland. I'm I'm wondering if that's the case. <laughs> I also I also loved uh, Emily Dickinson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Emily Dickinson and uh, and Frederick Douglass's autobiography is like no. you can't beat it. No, you can't no. beat that one at all. I mean that the students really got into that too. I mean they really got it. Mm -hmm. It's very direct and it's pretty short. You can mm -hmm. read a lot of it, you know, in a, in a brief mm -hmm. period of time. It's terrific. Yeah. Now, so many of those folks you just named were so great about settings and place and really generating that feeling of, of really being there. I mean, this was part of Poe's whole express modus operandi, you know, uh, the sensations of everything. But, but um, that's one thing I really think about with your work is how rooted it is in place. Whether you're writing about the place you grew up or the place you live now, or a place of the imagination, like that sand castle on the beach uh, in, in that story where, where of the whole lifetime that elapses over a few hours in a day. You really, you really make the reader feel that surroundings is that something you've always consciously worked on and has it changed at all with your shift in location from from the new york area to rural ohio something i've always done and then i became conscious of it because when i was writing the shadow year uh my editor jennifer brell told me jeff you got so many directions here. You got to cut this shit out, you know? <laughs> it's like, all right, we get it. We know where you are, you know? And I just, it became, I became conscious of it then. Uh, and, you know, we, we fixed it up and so forth. And then I became conscious of it. But place is really, I mean, when I moved to Ohio, I couldn't write it for us. One of the reasons was I didn't have a sense of the place. Um, and it's, I live in this farm area. <laughs> it's called the Ohio Till Plain. It's one of the most fertile areas in the country. I mean, you could grow anything here, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, I had to get a sense of that. And then the, once I knew that and I learned more about the, the area, the place, uh, it, it had a kind of a sentience to, uh, for me because it had been around so long. You know, I mean, people had been here farming this area for a long time. The house I live in is like 120 years old, so you know I get that I got that sense of uh, of the place, and that helped me to write you know more recent stories. But place is always you know important to me. I have to I I, I see it in my imagination, even the stuff that's fantastic, you know uh, I see it in my imagination very clearly. I got to see the place clearly for me to be able to you know to, to write. I don't know if that makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. Do you do you also have to have a sense of where the story begins or where it ends, or is that less important to you? Much less important. I'll give you an example. Like 
Ahab's Return, that's a book that I did in 2018, I think, all right? I never planned the story at all. I mean, I just started writing. But what I did do, I have to do research on the time period. Then I have that all in my mind, and then I just start the story, and then I follow the story. I, what I call pushing into the fiction. The more you push into it, it opens up before you. But I never have notes notes on and except for like the the research stuff for the for the historical part but m my stories i never make notes on them or keep notes or anything that way they always remain in my mind and i can go to the grocery store and like squeeze melons and pick up milk and stuff and the, the story can be working if i if i commit that to paper i gotta have my papers with me you know what i mean so I don't do any of that. I mean, it's a little it's a little fraught now that I'm getting older. I mean, some days I can't remember what my what my name is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but I never take notes or any of that stuff. But the the historical aspects of it and the uh, that kind of research is important to me. But it's two different things, really. I mean, one is one is just information. The other one is the impetus for the story. And that just comes from one word after another, and you follow it, you push into it, you know, and you follow it and push forward, and then the story opens up as you go. That's the way most, I mean, all my stuff really has been written. So, um, and, this, and this just fascinates me. How do you know when you've done enough research to get started, or are you doing some writing on that project all along simultaneous with the research? Well, I usually do the research first and then I'll start writing. But the thing is, it's like, you, you really got to like cut it off because you could go on forever doing research. You know yes. what I mean? I yes. mean, it's fun too. I really, the first time I did the physiognomy in those books and they were all completely confabulated, you know? But Jennifer then said to me, well, I want you to, set this in a historical time period and i'm like bummer man it's like fucking homework you know <laughs> uh but then once i got into that research it fascinated me the stuff i found out i mean you can't even you can't work it all in there yeah. you know the mm -hmm. other thing I'll, I'll tell you the other place i learned a lot about writing historical stuff is from you from reading what? the stories that are in uh Baluta Hatchie. you know those mm -hmm. those historical stories really showed me that like a little bit goes a long way, you know? I mean, a little bit of uh, historical detail goes a long way. And I would balance that out against, like, The Alienist by Caleb Carr, which is a terrific book, but around every corner is some major, like, figure, historical figure or, like, statue or whatever. And I realized that it has much more to do with the style of writing. If you can capture the style of writing of the time period, uh, you can get it across because I read books by like uh, Henry James and Edith Wharton for uh, Mrs. Chabu. Uh -huh. And there's no touchstones in that. You're not telling me about famous statues or famous restaurants and stuff like that. So a little bit, a little bit, you go a long way in historical writing. You can get, you know, you can get by with it. It's a very tricky, it's kind of a tricky mix, you know? Uh-huh. And, and... Now that you're talking about voice, which is part of certainly what conjuring this setting and this sense of place and time, um, one thing that fascinates me about your presenting your work is is how I, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's it's like a sort of casual way you do a reading. It's like it's like not even like performance, although it has to be on some level because it's really effective. And anybody and I always recommend that people go to Jeff Ford readings, like your readings at the KGB or your readings at World Fantasy. Uh, but yet it's like so conversational, no matter what the prose is like of the piece, you approach it like, yeah, OK, I got this thing. Here we go. You know. And then Mrs. Sharbuk said this and that. And, it, and it's just, is, to what extent have you thought about that? And to what extent have, has that, uh, to what extent do you th even think about that while you're writing or while you're preparing a reading? 
Well, I tell you, the readings for the stuff that really are, are touch me or are, 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 you know, part of me, those readings always come out the best. I just, I, they, they just afford me, I mean, the, the voice and stuff, I don't even plan it. I can't plan it. You know, sometimes I'll read a story that's a good story or whatever, but it just doesn't have the same, like, hold on me. Uh, you know, either in my personal life or in my imagination. Uh, but, um, and they read fine on the page. But as far as me reading them out loud, uh, the ones that, you know, the ones that mean uh, something special to me uh, are ones I usually read. Because I, I, I don't even have to do anything. I just open my mouth and read what's there. Mm -hmm. I don't really, I can't explain that. I can't explain it. Do you have any favorite reading pieces? I don't pieces? think about it much. Right. Do you have any favorite pieces of yours that are like go-to reading uh, performance pieces? I always, I always try to read a new story. I always try to read a new story every time I read. A couple of times that wasn't possible because of the situation. I mean, I, I, I've read this story, uh, Big Dark Hole, that's from this collection coming out in uh, July, on July 6th. I've read that story like three times, which is really unusual for me. You know, I'll, I'll always read a new story. That means that I always have to have a new story, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's, that's unusual. That's the first time I think I've ever read uh, something twice, more than, more than once. There might be another instance, I'm not sure. So tell me about the book and about anything else you're working on or that's coming out. Well, the book's coming out July. It's got 15 stories. There's three new stories in it that are new to the book that have never been published before. Um, and they're a mix, like all my collections are, a pretty eclectic mix of different styles and different you know, approaches to things. I'm putting together, uh, you know, some stuff for longer pieces, but I'm, I'm reluctant to talk about it. I'm talking to Derek too about doing some, uh, you know, some projects with him. Uh, this your artist, crazy. your your artist son, Derek. You mean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, um, I don't want to talk about. I, I hate to talk about stuff now before I do it. It's, it's, I understand. What's the title of the collection, and who's the publisher? The collection is Big Dark Hole, and it's the publisher is uh, is Small Beer, Gavin Grant and Kelly Link. Mm -hmm. They've. Uh, I think this is the second book I've done with them. Second collection. I do the no novels a lot of times with uh, Harper Collins, but. I did these collections and they were hugely helpful to me. I mean, you know, I've told these stories before, but like uh, Natural History of Hell, which was the other one, uh, I had it named Natural History of Autumn, which was the title of a story in it. And, um, you know, Gavin said, but, you know, our distributor loves the book, but they said the title sounds like people going to visit like Vermont with the, when the leaves change, you know, <laughs> Natural History of Autumn. Uh -huh. So then we were trying to think of a, we were trying to think of a title, and Kelly came up with the Natural History of Hell, and I was like, man, that's solid. I'm going, we'll, uh -huh. we'll go with that, you know. Also, um, with this one, you know, I had stories. I think I had about 17, 18 stories, and together we like we called them. Like they told me what they wanted, I said what I wanted, you know, and that's hugely helpful uh, to get. Uh, that other perspective uh, from people who really know publishing and really know fiction. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I've been very pleased with working with them. They're terrific. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, and that's a wonderful, for anybody that doesn't know the field very well or the current field, one one sort of infallible rule is, you know, what has what Small Beer Press been up to? You know, all those uh i mean full disclosure i have a book with small beer press but even accepting that all the other texts you know you can't go wrong with, with a good those. One too. <laughs> um 
what uh, what else do you want to talk about? We've got a couple minutes left. So they got some they got some old food. Hmm. Andy, let's talk. Let's talk about getting old. <laughs> Are are we are we getting old? My <laughs> quite a bit. I mean, I'm really seeing things from different perspectives now. Like are I said, even my characters have a hard time getting. Their I uh, do you feel like? Do you feel like the world is a stranger place now? But I notice weird shit. I see weird shit going on more, much more than I did when I was younger. Like, you know, like supernatural possibilities. Things. Like, like, like I see what? Them and I just pass them by. I don't know, man. Just weird. Uh, you know. Sometimes seeing people that have passed away, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, really kind of strange. strange stuff. I don't want them to cut, cut me out to the uh, funny farm yet. Yeah. Just saying this, you know, but no, I, you know, I strange think things like that. This Voices. is a, yeah, this is a universal experience. You know, you're not alone there. You may be, you may be, it's not so universal to talk about. But I think it's certainly universal to have these. These. No, um, we were talk, I was talking to. Um, well, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was talking about this with. Um, I did a panel thing the other day with uh, Victor Lavelle and, and Sam Miller, and uh, I was telling him my theory of the banal of the paranormal. You know, it's like. You see weird shit, and then you think to yourself, well, there's something behind this. This adds up to something. But in reality, it doesn't. And it's not that it wasn't strange, the experience of it, but it really doesn't add up to anything. It's not like a 19th century story where there's a resonance between the character and the, you know, and the event. Uh, there's no bow tying it together. You just, it's just like it happens, and then you see it, and then, all right, move on, you know? Uh, there's a story in the new collection, the five-pointed spell, that's based on that idea. And where I came up with it was, my buddy was telling me about how he was at a party, and he saw a gaucho in, a, in the glass of a hutch laughing, this guy, like, a, you know, uh, an Argentinian cowboy. And then he said, you know, that's it. That's all I saw. It never meant anything after that. I was that for weird, you know? And I remember this happening to me when I lived in Jersey. I've spoken about this before, too. I went out at night late after writing for a cigarette over to the park <clears throat> with my dog. And um, it was 3 in the morning, and there was a guy playing the bagpipes dressed in full Scottish regalia at this park. And I was like, you know... That's totally a fucking ghost, man. <laughs> Don't you can't tell me it's not. But you know, I got creeped out. We split. I got home and never added up to anything. It's not like you know. I think somebody said to me, "You should stop buying, uh, you know, more Scottish whiskey." Or something. There was no could, connection to anything. Could that's you? That's what I'm exploring now. I think I think that's that's wonderfully rich material. And and I can't wait to, to cool. see what you what you do with it, and uh, and I yeah, guess the last story the last story the last story in the book is that is that stuff it's it's uh, I call it the banal of the paranormal just an everyday thing you know we'll see how it goes <laughs> I I think it'll go very well I think we've reached the uh, the end of the official time slot. So thank you, Jeff, for all this. And uh, I'll return everybody to their, I will end this recording and send everybody else back to their regular, regular life already in progress. Thanks for, thanks for listening.